that his love endures forever. Thanks, brother. We appreciate the uh, team that comes together to set our sights and our hearts to worship. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Titled this, A Pastor's Desire, and it's, it's more specifically what we see out of Scripture here from Paul and his desire for this church at Thessalonica. And his desire was not necessarily things for him, but it was for things for them. If you will stand out of honor for God's word as we read this passage, I'll read and, and you can follow along. We'll be looking at chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. He writes to them, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Father, we pray that as we look at this passage, that it will just wash over us. That where we need to be encouraged, we will. Where we need to, to, for you to chastise us, I pray that we would receive that and I pray that it would lead us to repentance. Help us to understand through your spirit. Father, I pray you would help me to convey this message from your word. Help us to learn and to live, to love you above everything else, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. In Jesus' name, thank you. You may be seated. If you want this in kind of a nutshell, we're going to look at this in, in four uh, separate topics. And these can kind of be summarized by Paul's desire for them to pray, to trust, to obey, and to grow. When I read through that and kind of thought through that, <laughs> that song came to my mind, Trust and Obey. Remember when you were little and you sang that? For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We have here a series of general instructions for the church and its mission and its life. And this is being presented here in chapter 3 kind of under two main topics. One is Paul's desire for the church, and that's what we're going to look at here in verses 1 through 5. And then also the danger of idleness uh, that follows in verses 6 through 16, and then there's a couple of verses where he finishes out the book. We're going to spend the time that we have this morning in verses 1 through 5, where this pastor communicates his desire from his congregation. Several passages deal with the responsibilities that we have as sheep and the responsibilities that shepherds have, or under-shepherds, if you will. Scripture is clear in stating the duties and responsibilities of both. And we see this in 1 Thessalonians, where in uh, chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, care for you in the Lord, and who... Uh, admonish you, hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. We also see uh, here in this commands for the sheep, we're to acknowledge those who work hard among us, those who are over us and care for us, hold them in the highest regard. And then kind of interesting enough, it seems almost out of place, he says live at peace with each other. It's amazing how that part of us living with peace or maybe not living with peace with each other has an impact on the under-shepherd. We also see uh, commands for the shepherd 
or the under shepherd in John chapter 21 verse 17 simply stated tend my sheep a lot is packed into those three words in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 uh, there was a commitment by the under shepherds to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word and then also in Hebrews Believers are to obey and admonish so that their pastors can do their work with joy. Chapter 13, verse 7, obey your leaders, submit to them. Let them do their work with joy, not with groaning. And then in our text this morning, it provides additional insight directly uh, from Paul's heart regarding what, may, what any dedicated pastor desires from his people. So we're going to look at that in these four headings of prayer, trust, obey, and grow. Now you'll remember that in the middle of all of this, uh, this church at Thessalonica was not without its problems. A few of the believers were lazy, some of them were timid, and some of them were weak. They all tested one another's patience. And if you're going to live as a family together, and you're going to love and serve others as a family together, that's going to happen. There are going to be at times when things just, it's not your day. Everything that can go wrong seems to go wrong. You get testy with one another. We also see that at times they were shaken and troubled by rumors. Other problems existed as well. But let's look at this first point of Paul's desire and his desire for pastors that they receive prayer from their people. In verses 1 and 2, he says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from evil or from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. We see in this passage that this sequence of responsibilities is kind of logical. It's learning and living, and they go together. Those things that we learn, we should be living out. It should impact our growth. It should impact the way that we live and treat one another. We guard the truth and practice it so that we can share it with others. Obviously, we cannot share that which we do not know. So it's imperative for us to know the living God first, for us to have a relationship with him. Our purpose statement begins with that topic of follow Christ. Love God, love others, and serve the world. We can best share that which we have practiced ourselves, right? It's been said that if you really want to learn something, teach it to someone else. That's when you'll really understand. The Word of God is glorified in the lives of those who share it and those who receive it. So under this, pastors desire for their people's prayers. The first part is to pray for the messenger. Paul's plea for prayer for himself and his associates, as he says, brothers, pray for us. And we find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and, and verse 25. Paul is making some concluding remarks there. When he says in verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus, who calls you, he calls you, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Paul considered prayer the one means by which everyone could participate in his ministry. And he asked frequently for this prayer, that he might accomplish the task set before him. And for also for those who would hinder this gospel being presented. So why is prayer so important in the life of a pastor? You've heard... Don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. And I think that's the same thing here with pastors. We really, it's hard for us to even conceive the weight of the souls 
and leading a congregation. One of the things I found that was interesting, some statistics about American pastors, and this came from prayingforpastors.com. I want you just to think about some of these numbers. The first one, 1,700 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. That's a lot of pastors. We'll just continue to move on through those. 50% of pastors are so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, but they have no other way of making a living. 70% of pastors can constantly fight depression. 80% believe pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. 70% say they have a lower self-image now than when they first entered the ministry. 40% report serious conflict with a parishioner or their someone in their congregation at least once a month. 90% of pastors report working between 55 and 75 hours a week. 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry will leave the ministry within the first five years. 70% felt God called them to pastoral ministry before their ministry began, but after three years of ministry, only 50% still felt called. 70% of pastors do not have a close friend, a confidant, or a mentor. And only 10% of ministers will actually retire as a minister in some form. These numbers are staggering. And for me, I would even ask the question, well, why is it so important that I pray for my pastor? These numbers reveal that need. And if you look at the toll on pastors' families, 50% of pastors' marriages will end in divorce. 80% of pastors' wives feel left out, unappreciated by the church members. 80% of pastors' spouses wish their, wish their spouse would choose another profession. This is staggering. Any way you look at these numbers, they're staggering. Even if we took these numbers and just kind of said, well, there's some margin for error. We don't know how the statistics were done. It may not be statistically significant. Even if we halved those numbers, they're still daunting, regardless of how the numbers are created and the validity of them. Even at half, it's amazing. Paul asked this church, pray for me. So I think this morning, the challenge that we've been given is to join together in upholding our pastor and his family. The sad truth is pastors often feel lonely, overworked, underappreciated, and unqualified to fulfill the call of God in their lives. Can you even imagine the weight of knowing that you have to answer for the souls of those who are under your care? <laughs> that, just that in itself, I, I can't even get my head around that. Knowing that Brother Bill cannot change my heart, he can't change my mind, he can't change my attitude. The only person that can do that is the Holy Spirit. So he's, in, he's, in, he's charged with gathering a group of people in this particular congregation, leading them to holiness, to, to godliness, to, to be able to minister the word themselves, and all the time he has to rely on God to do a work in my life that he can't do. I mean, it's just amazing. So what are we supposed to do? What can you and I do day to day, month to month, to help positively impact Brother Bill's life and his ministry here? Well, <laughs> obviously, we can rise to this challenge that Paul asked the church at Thessalonians or at Thessalonica to rise to, and that is commit to praying for our pastor. And I found a, a handout. If, if our ushers would, would come forward, I'd like for us to uh, hand this out. This is a list, uh, just a front and back page of ways uh, that we can pray for our pastor. 
And this is important enough that even here in the middle of the service, I wanted us to hand this out and I wanted us to take a second to look at this to really understand some of the ways how we can encourage. And, and, and if we look at uh, th this slide here, the handout that you're getting is broken down into to four categories. is personal needs, family needs, spiritual needs, and congregational needs. So just take a second and just kind of peruse through some of these things. Personal needs, true humility, stability, relationships, joy, health, self-discipline. As far as family needs, family relationships, pressures. Spiritual needs, spiritual refreshness or freshness. Prayer, integrity, spiritual warfare, accountability. Congregational needs, pulpit prep preparation, Christ-centered and Christ-exalting preaching. There are many of these things we can just simply thank God that he is already working that out here. And pray that he would continue to do that. Faithful relationships, congregational growth, mobilization, discernment, counseling. A lot of these, we could pray for each other. <laughs> so Paul asked this congregation, Pray. Pray for us. I'd like to encourage you to take this sheet of paper, and you may want to take a picture of it so that you've got it on your phone, and you can just flip through at lunchtime or whenever you have a few minutes, scroll through that list, and begin praying. You may need to post this on a refrigerator. <laughs> First thing I thought of. <laughs> That's where I go frequently. <laughs> may need to put it on your toolbox. What an amazing thing for someone to walk by and say, what in the world is that? Oh, I'm praying for my pastor. <laughs> he needs it. And I, I should be giving this to him. Church membership means something, and this is one of the things that it means. Keep this with you. When I was thinking about praying for, for Brother Bill, one of the things that I thought of is, when was the last time I just called him and said, Brother, I, I thank you for your ministry here. Thank you for your work here. Appreciate you coming to this pulpit week after week and presenting the entirety of God's Word. So Paul asks for prayer. And he also asked in this passage, pray for the message. So we see in chapter 3, verse 1, finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. First he asked the Thessalonians to pray that the message of the Lord may speed rapidly and be honored. Speed ahead or speed rapidly translate this word that means to run. Paul is, is asking for the prayers of people, not only for him, but this message that he is delivering and taking would actually be unleashed to run. Have you ever, have you ever unhooked a leash off of an animal that was ready to go? It's, it's hard to even get the latch unhooked. I mean, because there, some of your lap, you've got dogs or 
horses or whatever kind of animal, uh, I mean, when they're ready to go, they're ready to go. And you telling them to sit and to be still while you get that latch undone is not a part of what's going on. That's the same kind of thoughts that came to mind when I thought about this message, this gospel being unleashed. It needs to, it needs to run hard and fast and free. Brother Bill has said many times, we don't need to defend the word. Just let it go. It'll defend itself. Let it run. And while it's good for us to know the word, it's good for us to understand the word, to study, to, to show ourselves approved, arguing the, the finer points of this gospel doesn't quite measure up to the task that we've been given to go and make disciples. It's good for us to know those things. It's good for us to, to think through, what does this mean? What is the meaning of this word, this text, this book? How did it impact the people that it was written to? We need to, that's good things for us to know. But don't forget our mission. Our mission is to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That fleshes itself out day to day in me being a good disciple and me being a good disciple maker. Both of those encompassed here. We see here that Paul requested prayer not for himself but for the gospel, that it might be spread even more rapidly than it had to date. And it was spreading quickly. We also see in chapter 3, verse 2, he says, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. Paul had once been a, an opponent to this gospel being spread. He knew the type of obstacles he could face. He had been on the other side of that, right? He had been this, on the side opposing the spread of this. He had been on the side opposing the people who spread this gospel, this good message. And he says, I need for you to pray that this may be delivered, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. Paul was asking the church to pray that he and his co-workers would be delivered from those who were not persons of faith and who would use any means to stop the spread of the good news. And we see this in the countries that we pray for year, week by week, all year. There are many who are not of faith who will use any means possible to stop the spread of good news. So we see first that pastors desire their people's prayers, and then we also see pastors desire their people to trust in the Lord. Pastors desire their people to trust in the Lord. In verse 3 it says, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. No matter what difficulties faced them, Paul knew that the Lord would be faithful to accomplish his purpose for them. That takes faith. For Brother Bill to believe that God is going to accomplish in my heart and in my life the faith that's necessary, that's, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure how much I would trust me to be faithful. <laughs> God is so faithful that as we trust in his spiritual provisions, we will always be able to handle the assaults from the world's evil system. So what does it look like to trust? The psalmists capture over 50 examples of this trust. And I just went through and picked out a few of these. And if you want a copy of this, let me know. But I just want you to, to just, just listen to this as the word washes over you and think about. You can trust the Lord. Some of these are just a statement of such, and some of them are examples of how. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Those who know your name, trust 
in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Have you ever felt forsaken? But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Do you need salvation? The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise, making wise the simple. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. For the king trusts in the Lord through the unfailing love of the Most High. He will not be shaken. In your ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him. Are you in need of rescuing today? You can trust the Lord. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. In you, O Lord. Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me. Sometimes we're, we're stepping out either at work or at home or in a difficult situation and we need to know that we can trust the Lord, that we will not be put to shame. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. Sometimes that's the reason we need to be, sometimes it's all we can do just to kind of crawl in here. Especially if you've had one of those weeks. It's been difficult. Sometimes you're going through a situation that's long and drawn out. It's not just an episode that happened last week. It could be something that's ongoing for many months. And you, and you come in here and your guts are hanging out. You don't know whether to come in out of the rain or just stand out in it. I've been in those situations. Here. You can trust in the Lord. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. As for me, I trust in the Lord. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. What an amazing thing to just, and, and this was just, uh, I didn't even make it to chapter 40 in Psalm here. This is less than half of them. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Pastors desire their people to trust the Lord. Just looking at the beginning of Psalms, we've seen 15 or 20 ways. Confidence in the Lord as the one who strengthens and protects his people lead to a confidence in the church and the sure perseverance of the faithful. Paul intended, and his intent was, to call the church to persevere in the walk and the ministry given by the Lord, even as he himself persevered based on his confidence in the Lord. The third thing, the third pastoral desire that we want to look at is in chapter 3 and verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. This is a pastor's desire for their people their people's obedience to what is taught. Based on what they were already doing, Paul had confidence in the Lord 
that they would continue to do as he had taught them. As their pastor, he had spent much time explaining the word of God, and in doing so, he had the authority to command them to obey it. Scripture is full of commands for obedience. And as Brother Bill has been faithful to teach us the Word of God, we have heard several of these. Look at some of these commands. Repent. Let not your heart be troubled. Follow me. Rejoice. Let your light shine. Honor God's law. Be reconciled. Do not commit adultery. These are just some of the commands of Scripture that as we work through books, chapters, and verses, this is what we hear. Keep your word. Love your enemies. Be perfect. Practice secret disciplines. Giving, praying, fasting. Lay up treasures in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God. Judge not. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Ask, seek, and knock. Do unto others. Choose the narrow way. Beware of false prophets. Pray for those who spread the word. Honor your parents. Fear God. Do not fear man. Listen to God's voice. Beware of false teaching. Deny yourself. Do not despise little ones. Go to Christians who offend you. Forgive offenders. Beware of covetousness. Honor marriage. Lead by being a servant. Make the church a house of prayer for all nations. Pray in faith. Bring in the poor. Render unto Caesars. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor. Be born again. Celebrate the Lord's Supper. Watch and pray. Keep my commandments. Feed my sheep. Make and baptize disciples. Teach disciples to obey. These are some of the commands of Scripture, certainly not exhaustive, but just some of them. We're going to hear these in and out of passages that we look at week to week, month to month. These are the things, these are the commands that we are to obey. These are the commands that a faithful minister of the word presents to his congregation and says, Thus saith the Lord. It's the duty of all believers, as it was for the church in Thessalonica, to obediently follow the divine commands their pastor gives them, whether he is present or absent. The fourth pastor's desire for their people is for them to grow spiritually. In verse 5, he says, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Because of his confidence in God's faithfulness and based on their delight in obeying God's commands, Paul anticipated the best from the Thessalonians. But he desired that they continue in their spiritual growth. So he asked that the Lord direct their hearts. Direct or make straight is the same word that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 to indicate the removal of all obstacles and hindrances. In my mind, I think of this as clearing a path. Sometimes when we're in a crowded group of people, my wife will pull me along and she says, you go first. Why? Well, it's easy for her to fall right back in behind me because... Well, I'm about twice as wide as she is. <laughs> it's just, it, it didn't need to laugh out loud. <laughs> it's, it, it's just easy for her to fall right in behind me because I'm clearing a path out. <laughs> That's the kind of the, the word image when, uh, that I got when it says um, to make straight or to direct. Paul did not want their spiritual progress to halt, but rather that the Lord would clear the way so that their hearts or inner persons would remove or would move into the love of God. Second, the apostle desires that God would direct the Thessalonians' heart to grow stronger in the steadfastness of Christ. 
Paul wanted the Thessalonians to increasingly understand how patient Christ was with their sins, their problems, and their struggles. Why? This leads to greater spiritual endurance. This, this demonstrates that we're good disciples of Christ. We take this word, we trust it, we obey it, and it causes growth. So how do we grow spiritually? In my life, it seems like that as I pray and as I trust God, as I obey him, I do grow spiritually. And the times when I do not trust him, the times when I do not obey him, he offers a second opportunity. We will get these lessons down. And if we decide in some cases that we're going to remain a little stiff-necked, maybe kind of throw back from our ancestors, uh, Adam and Eve, we decide, I will not have anyone to rule over me. God will continue to pressure us where we're just miserable. Can't stand it any longer. I have to obey. My latest opportunity to trust, to pray, to trust God and to be obedient came a week ago Saturday when Brother Bill called me and said, I need for you to, to preach on Sunday. <laughs> that was the latest one for me. And boy, I began to pray. <laughs> I began to pray fervently. And then as the week wore on, my wife began to hear me grumble because I didn't have enough time. And she even helped Saturday, yesterday, helped me uh, work through some of the things, some of the things you're seeing now. Help me work through that. I just don't have enough time. Do I trust God or do I not trust God? When situations come like that and you, you look at it and you say, well, this is an opportunity for God to perfectly orchestrate his will this week. Because either he's in charge or I am, right? Faith evangelism training offered many opportunities to pray, to trust God, to be obedient to his command, and to grow spiritually. Talking to my neighbors. Repenting to my neighbors. <laughs> That's an opportunity for growth standing on their doorstep and praying with them, sharing my faith. You've got stories. God has led you through different places in your life where you've had an opportunity to say, I think I can handle this, or humbly fall to your knees. Say, God, I, I can't do this. Some of them are heart-wrenching. Some of them are just, seem to more, it's like you just can't figure stuff out. Hosting students from Saudi Arabia. We had some significant growth opportunities there. Is it okay for us to have halal meat in our house? Meat that's been sacrificed in the name of Allah? Is that okay? Is it okay for us to eat that? Really kind of got to search the scriptures going almost two years being unemployed was a test. What are yours? You may, have, you may be right in the middle of some of those tests right now. I want to encourage you here from just, just this text to pray. Humble yourself before the Lord. Cry out to Him. And then everything that within you that, that lies within you. Confirm to yourself that you can trust Him. And then commit to obeying Him as He'll give us opportunities to demonstrate our trust and our faith and our commitment. So in this passage, Paul provides an excellent example 
of genuine pastoral concern. How much do we really pray? Again, I ask myself that question. How much do I pray for Brother Bill? How much do we really trust God? Do we trust God enough to follow him in our families? Do we trust God enough to follow Brother Bill, our under-shepherd here, as he leads, as God leads? How often do we obey God? Obey without being disgruntled and without delay. <laughs> I've got some work in that area, and it was, it was revealed yesterday to me. <laughs> I need to work on obeying without being disgruntled and without delay. Or we could, uh, delayed obedience is disobedience, right? These are the measure of our spiritual growth. You may be here this morning, and you've never really trusted God, not with your eternal destiny, but you can, right here, cry out to him to save you. If you have perhaps uh, a need to repent to God for your lack of prayer or maybe your lack of trust or perhaps a lack of obedience. If you would like to visit with someone or to pray with someone, you'll have an opportunity here to just to, to come forward and I'd be honored to do that. If you'd like to become a member let us know and we'll begin that process. We need to ask ourselves these difficult questions. Pray. Trust. Obey. And grow spiritually. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come, to look into your word, to, to see what Paul asked of this church. And Father, in, in some points to recognize that, that our pastor, your under-shepherd, would ask the same of us. Help us to be faithful to you and to be faithful to him as you lead him. Father, we thank you for the, for the opportunities that you reveal our hearts to us by putting in situations putting us in situations where we need to trust you more and it reveals inside of us it reveals from our hearts who we really are and where we really are in that spectrum of trusting you and also in obeying you i pray that we would just be we would be diligent to be faithful to what you've called us to be and what you through your spirit have enabled us to be for your glory, for the advance of your kingdom as you make your kingdom come here on earth through us in Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and stand. We do dealing.